pals, I'm here today to talk about five 2024 releases that I've recently read. Four of these five books were on my summer TBR, which I will link above. And the fifth one is was one of my most anticipated releases of the year. So yeah, a, a nice group of books that I was looking forward to reading to talk about. I didn't give any of these books less than like three, three and a half stars. So I would recommend them all. But as usual, I will rank them. So I'm going to start with the one I enjoy the least and work my way up to the one I enjoyed the most, which was a five star read. Absolutely loved it. So yeah, I'm excited to talk about this group of books. So I sometimes struggle when I give books three, three and a half stars to decide which ones I ultimately enjoyed more or less when I when I rank them. So I'll I would put these first two books on maybe an even playing field, but kind of for different reasons. I'm going to talk about Levitation for Beginners first because I've just finished it. So it's the freshest in my mind and that is by Susanna Dunn. So this is a book set in 1972. It is narrated from the perspective of a young girl called Deborah. She's 10 years old and she lives rather unusually for the time with her single mother, who is quite a young mother. She's 29 and she lives alone with her mother because her father passed away when she was very young. She was the new girl at her school because they've only lived in this small village for a couple of years. But when the book opens, a, another new girl starts at the school called Sarah Jane. Sarah Jane is definitely from a more affluent background. And also she just seems to know a lot more than Deborah and the other girls do. And so this book is about how unsettled Deborah feels by Sarah Jane, how Sarah Jane really changes the dynamic in their very small village primary school. There's only like six girls in the class and three boys. And how all the girls start to mimic Sarah Jane and go along with what she says. She can be quite catty and say quite disparaging things about adults that she's clearly heard from other adults. And yeah, Deborah feels increasingly unsettled by her. And also a kind of side part of the narrative is that there is a young man who's 19 and working on a builder site locally and he sort of sparks up a friendship with Deborah's mother. And that's something that Deborah's really embarrassed by. She thinks it's really odd that there's this young man coming around and having a chat with her mum and stuff and she's trying to kind of keep this from people. Now what you may be able to tell from my description is the book is fairly plotless and so writing style wise and vibe wise I loved this book and it's one of those books I started and felt like it ended up being five star because the descriptions of the time period are amazing. Um, I read my mum a section from the book that described like all the things that happened in the year of 1972 because my mum would have been nine in 1972 and yeah she really loved reminiscing and telling me like some of the things that were mentioned I didn't know what they were and she was telling me about them yeah and I, I just thought it captured the time really well I think it gave a real sense of how different life was for children in the 70s compared to for example the 90s when I grew up and yeah I really liked that sense. I also like that she imbued the 1970s with this kind of sense of children perhaps not being as safe as they were in later decades, which is something I've discussed a lot with um, some of the older people in my life, that kind of how there was, you know, for example, a lot of young girls were abducted in the 70s, a lot of adults were abused by, by men who were either family members or friends of the families, and that all kind of went unnoticed or willfully ignored by people in that um, you know, in that era and before that. And so that's kind of a presence in the book. So yeah, so I really enjoyed the writing style and the vibe and all that, but barely anything happens. More stuff is revealed in the blurb than I'm telling you, but that stuff doesn't happen until the last 50 pages. So I don't think it should even be in the blurb. And the book is one where it does really leave you hanging. Like there's a few threads that you think are gonna to build to something bigger. They don't really. So yeah, I really enjoyed the writing, the vibe, but I do think it feels a little bit half finished. And I'm not sure, I think I'd watch out for what this author brings out in future. The reason I'm a bit unsure if I'd read more books by her is because her last five or six books have been historical fiction books about the Queens of England, which is just not something I'm really interested in. And then she wrote a few contemporary fiction books before that that have also got quite like negative reviews on Storygraph. So yeah, I'd probably look out to see what this author does in the future. But yeah, if you just like the sound of this time period and reading from a young girl's perspective, I think it's done really well. 
like as an adult reader you know a lot more than Deborah she hears a lot of things that she doesn't understand and there's a lot of kind of humour in the book because of that but also this kind of sense of unease which I enjoyed. Then we have Spoiled Creatures by Amy Twigg so I'm kind of sad to be talking about this book at this part of the video because I was so excited by the premise of this book I thought it sounded amazing and thought it could be like uh, you know a stand-up book of the year for me and sadly that isn't the case and I'm left feeling with this book like I would keep an eye on what this author does in the future but I wouldn't 100% pick up her next book. So the premise of this which does sound excellent is that it is set in the Kent Downs in a rural area. We meet this young woman in her late 20s I think called Iris who has recently broken up with her boyfriend, she moved back home with her mum and yeah she's li living this quite kind of lonely and unfulfilled life. One day while walking a dog her mum's dog she bumps into uh, this woman called Hazel and she is aware that there is this woman's commune um, kind of locally and that Hazel is a member of this commune and very quickly in the narrative Iris joins this commune she gives up all of her kind of possessions and her finances and she goes to live in this yeah in this uh, commune in this rural area where all these women live. Some women don't live there and they just come and visit and work for the day. But yeah, they all kind of live off the land and they sell their produce in the local villages. And yeah, they, they live very differently. Certain things sort of become more natural uh, because it's just all women living together in a way where I think sometimes we read or hear about communes and think that sounds kind of cool. Like, for example, if they're all tending to the vegetable plot and it's really hot they just do it in their knickers because well we're all women and we all know what boobs look like and not really a big deal that sounds quite nice and refreshing and not quite as sweaty as it would otherwise be and when they share a bathroom there's some bits that are described as kind of gross but there's kind of I was gonna say like a niceness to the grossness I don't know I would feel more okay as a woman with living with other women's grossness than other men's grossness. Does that make sense? There's there's an element of it that feels kind of like they're all in solidarity with each other, which I like. Sort of going off topic here. This is me talking about an all-woman commune. So yeah, what the book says in the blurb is that Iris arrives. She thinks it's all going to be hunky-dory and lovely. But actually, there's this woman running the commune who very much has them all sort of under her power. And they kind of look towards her as almost like uh, an otherworldly or sort of godly figure. They think she has kind of abilities. And so they trust a lot of things to her that they shouldn't. You know, they if someone has an accident, they don't seek medical help. They think that she can fix it kind of thing. And yeah, and, and in the blurb, you're told that the book builds up to this kind of violence. And it does. But... I don't think this book is doing anything that different to a lot of other books that have dealt with this topic. In fact, I read Hackstone by Sinead Gleeson earlier this year, which has a kind of different plot to it, but it does also have a women's commune and it does kind of result in an act of violence. And the, the plot points at the end felt a little bit similar. Also this book, and this is said in the blurb, is kind of um, reminiscent of The Girls by Emma Klein. It has that narrative voice. Iris is telling us this story afterwards, having escaped the commune. And you know that loads of some stuff went down and for whatever reason she, she got away with it. And that's kind of the premise of The Girls by Emma Klein. So yeah, I just read this book and I felt like everything it was doing, it was doing well. I liked the writing about the land. I liked the writing about the countryside but it wasn't doing anything that new and the writing style wasn't amazing enough that this kind of plot I'd read before was standing head and shoulders above any other books. So yeah, I enjoyed this one. I think if you're interested in the premise, you should read it. But I also, yeah, ultimately felt quite let down by it because I thought I would really love it. Then the next one was actually our Patreon book club pick for August. And that is Little Rot by Kwaki Amezi. Now I've only read one book from this author before and that is Death Made a Fool of Your Beauty and I really enjoyed that one and I thought the premise of this sounded really intriguing. This is a lot more, I guess the right word is triggering than I was expecting so I'm going to put some big caveats here in terms of whether you should read this book. I've heard from a couple of people that they stopped reading this book quite early on and I completely understand that. The premise of this is that you follow five characters 
over one weekend in Nulagos when some shit goes down and a lot of the shit that goes down goes down at sex parties and a big element within this book is sexual violence and discussions around sex work and consent. So there are 100% some pretty hard to read scenes to do with sexual violence. And also I think it's probably best for me to say there is discussion of sexual violence as pertains to minors. So yeah, it's quite sort of, you know, it's not very really nice some of it to read. I found it readable. It didn't find it too much for me. And I think it was all handled really well. I found this book a wild ride. Like I don't read many books that have this much plot and actually enjoy them. And I did really enjoy this. I read the first few chapters one day and then like the next day I just sat and read the rest of it because the way this is structured is that you'll hear from one character, you'll hear about sort of six hours in the weekend and then the next character you'll go back and hear about the six hours from their perspective because they're not always together. So yeah, there's a fair amount of kind of violence in this and a lot of sex. I really love the way this author writes about food and bodies and clothes and colour. They write beautifully about colour. And I like the commentary in this about a place like New Lagos and how if you live in places like that and everyone around you is kind of involved in these kind of, you know, immoral things, you kind of get pulled into it. And that's kind of what this book's about. So yeah, if you want a fast paced, wild ride, with some really interesting characters, very queer, and I very much enjoyed that, then I'd recommend it. But consider the trigger warnings before you pick it up, because it's not an easy read. So, but I will definitely be going back and reading Aquaiki and Mezzi's previous books, and I'll continue to pre-order their books going forward, because again, I enjoyed this one. Then I listened on audio to Swanna in Love. That's written by Jennifer Bell and narrated by Sophie Amos. And the reason I mention the narrator is because I loved this book. I'm aware <laughs> that a lot of people wouldn't love this book. I think it's sitting at like 3.70 or something on Storygraph, which isn't amazing. But for me, this really worked. But I do think that part of me really loving this book was that the narrator did an amazing job on audio. I feel like it added at least half a star to the experience for me. So I would highly recommend this on audio. I got it over on Everand, so it was just part of like my monthly payment. So yeah, would definitely recommend the audio book. Now, before I talk about this book, I do want to say, and when I describe it, you're going to be like, but this book does give Mary Jane vibes by Jessica Anya Blau, which I listened to an audiobook last summer and also really enjoyed, even though I could see that there was kind of, it wasn't perfect. Every now and again, usually if I really love a book, I can't see much room for criticism with it. But every now and again, I love a book that I don't give five stars because I don't think it's a perfect book. I don't think it's really anything really new or exciting, but for whatever reason, I loved it. Like I had a great time reading it. Maybe I should just give it five stars then. I don't know, how do you do your star ratings? And this was one of those. And it has Mary Jane vibes because it's all told in the perspective of a young girl, she's 14. And it's about this kind of one summer and it's about her having lots of experiences during that summer that kind of change her perspective on people and also about her being involved with adults who perhaps don't act like adults, which is part of the premise of Mary Jane. However, this book is a lot darker than Mary Jane and there is some reviews where this is described as like a contemporary Lolita. So that's the vibes we're going for here, right? So the way this book opens is that Swanna is about to leave summer camp. She's about to get on the coach and go home from New York when one of the camp counselors says, oh, actually Swanna, we've just had a call saying that you're not going on the coach back to New York to be with your father. Instead, your mother's gonna pick you up and take you home. And she's like, oh, a bit weird, look, fine. So she gets off the coach, everybody else leaves summer camp and she's left there. Hours later, her mother arrives in a truck with a much younger man who she calls her Russian lover, okay? And she says, it's hard for me to even remember his real name because the whole book Swanna gives him different cruel nicknames. I think his name is Borislav, but like I said, he's called Borislob, all, all sorts of different things throughout the book. And he has a residency at an artist's commune in the woods in Vermont. 
and this mother has decided to take Swanna and her eight-year-old brother Madding with them to the commune and spend a few weeks there before they go back to New York and to school. So they, they go and pick up Madding and then the book is those kind of few weeks at the artist colony. What you very quickly realise is that Swanna's mother and perhaps her father, but he's off page, is completely irresponsible. You realise that Swanna is much older than her years in terms of the responsibility she holds for her own and her younger brother's safety. Her mother is incredibly interested in her own love life and not that interested in Swanna and, and Madding and their happiness or their safety. She thinks that they should just be super happy for her that she's in love after this kind of messy divorce with Swanna's father. And so Swanna is super unhappy and resentful. And at the start of this book, it really does have those kind of Mary Jane vibes. I saw some reviews where people said they found this book really hard to read because all of the adults are really frustrate, frustrating. And they are, like you, you're so annoyed as an adult reader, you're so annoyed with the adults in the book for just how irresponsible they are. But it's kind of funny the way Swanna narrates it. I, I just thought her tone was spot on. And again, the audiobook narrator added so much to that. I thought the she sounded like a 14 year old girl who's just so annoyed with her mum, like it was spot on. The way the story kind of really kicks off is that they go to a bowling alley and an uh, older man who's in his late thirties is there with his, his children. He starts to chat to Swanna as though she's much older than she is. And basically they start dating. And Swanna sort of sneaks off to meet this man and a relationship ensues. And from that point on, this book feels much more like a book like My Dark Vanessa, which I know loads of people really enjoyed. Now I think another reason a lot of people have criticized this book and it's got the sort of rating it has, when I think it deserves a much higher one, is because in a lot of people's reviews, I think they thought, the author wasn't criticising this older man. They thought that the author wasn't saying how vile and wrong he was and like, you know, it's illegal. He's having sex with a minor and yeah, he's awful, he's abhorrent. The author doesn't write that on the page, but clearly you're supposed to think that. But I think some readers, a lot of readers, have read this book and thought, oh, this author's horrible writing this romance between this 14 year old girl and this 37 year old man and it's disgusting it's supposed to be disgusting this book i think is a really excellent examination of how some children can feel much older than their years and can convince themselves that they're the seductress and they're the ones who orchestrated this whole affair and can bear the guilt of that and carry that into adulthood. And I think this is a brilliant kind of microcosm of that all in the space of a few weeks. And it feels super icky, but it feels very true to what that, you know, it feels very true to My Dark Vanessa has some really upsetting scenes because there's points when Vanessa does feel like she's being coerced. And that isn't the case with, with this book. This book is about what if it happened to somebody who at all points felt like they were having a great time and how wicky is it still? Like, of course. And yeah, so I just think the, the kind of pairing of like that, those Mary Jane, like summer teen kind of vibes and the voice being spot on with this really tricky subject matter, I think were done really well. I think this type of book is always difficult to kind of end, but I think, I think where the ending went was really good. So I loved this book. So I think it is probably, I think I've spoken myself into saying that it, it does deserve a five stars from me. And I understand that maybe for a lot of people it wouldn't, but this is what I mean when I say I like coming of age narratives, because this feels so true to the voice of a teenager. And like I said, the audiobook narrator really added to that. So yeah, if you like the sound of this one, I would highly recommend you give it a go. And then this is a bit of a weird one to end the video on because I'm actually kind of dreading talking about this, which is odd because I love it and I gave it five stars. But it's a kind of unwieldy plot to talk about. But also I, I do feel a bit conflicted about this one. So, I, so I'll discuss that as part of my review, I guess. So that book is The Echoes by Evie Wilde. I have read all of Evie Wilde's previous books and so I had this book on pre-order. 
because I loved the Bass Rock and I loved her graphic memoir, Everything Is Teeth. Her other two novels I enjoyed, I didn't love, but I loved the Bass Rock enough to want to wanna carry on following whatever she brought out next. And yeah, so I was super excited to read this book. This book is only around 200 pages and so it's a very quick read and when I explain the plot now it's going to sound like there's way too much going on but I will try my best. There are a couple, Max and Hannah, who I think are in their late 20s, early 30s and Max dies and the book opens with Max realising he's a ghost and he's like, oh shit, like come back as a ghost, can't remember how I died so I'd like to figure that out and also, isn't this awful watching Hannah grieve for me? But what becomes really interesting is that Hannah was an incredibly guarded person. There was lots of stuff about her life, in particular her family life, that she never told Max. And in watching her alone afterwards, he knows more about her than he ever did before. And so the book is told both from Max's perspective, and he's always trapped in their flat, just watching Hannah and his perspective is really funny which sounds bizarre he's a ghost he's watching someone grieving for him but he has this kind of wry sense of humor she gets a cat and he realizes that the cat is kind of aware of, of his presence and he's always trying to do things in the house to make Hannah know he's there and he can never get them to work like turning light switches on and off and stuff like that he can never do it but he realizes that the cat knows he's there and so he starts trying to like throw things towards the cat. And there's kind of this point when he's like, oh, you fucking idiot cat, like just acknowledge me. So it's quite kind of bizarre, but, but really funny. And then the rest of the narrative is Hannah's perspective, in large part focused on her childhood growing up in Australia. And then also the perspective of her mother, her father, her uncle, and a man who sold some land to their parents. The title, The Echoes, has various meanings. The area of land she lived on was known as The Echoes, and it has this horrific past of being what was a school for Aboriginal children that were stolen from their families, horrifically abused, robbed of their language, and yeah, and basically never got to see their families again. And so that land is called the Echoes, which is where Hannah grew up. There's also kind of the Echoes in that this is really a book about trauma and that echoing through the generations, which is why you see perspectives from people in these different generations. And there's also the Echoes of, of Max as a ghost, kind of repeating his life, only ever able to do the things he did before when he was alive, right? And so, as I said, this is a book in large part about trauma. And so I want to highlight here that this book has a lot of quite difficult content about violence and child abuse and sexual assault. There's a lot crammed into these 220 pages. And it is a book you do read with kind of this mounting sense of dread. So it's crazy that it packs so much in because you find out a lot about this family's history and the kind of different generations of this family. It never felt squashed into me though. It, it always felt like the right amount. It felt like we got to know these characters. This isn't a fast paced book, but I felt like she did a really good job of telling you the right information about characters for you to get to know a lot of them as a person within like 20 pages. I think she'd be a really good short story writer. But the reason I say I'm uneasy about loving this one as much as I did is because after I read it, I knew the whole time, you know when you, you just know, when you're reading a book and you just think, unless something goes completely wrong here, I'm loving this. Like just everything about the writing, I just can't critique it. Like I just think she's a brilliant writer. I loved all the sections in England in the flat. I loved all the kind of dinner parties they had with their friends and the evenings down the pub. I loved all the descriptions of the kind of family life and the coming of age narrative in Australia. Any character she was writing about, I was interested in hearing from them. I, I just, yeah, I just thought it was all perfection. And also having read all of her books, 
I could really feel this is a book where it's very clear this is by the same author as her previous book. She's really interested in the same topics. She was somebody who had one Australian parent and one British parent and kind of grew up, um, you know, visiting back and forth. And yeah, and this has elements of her other novels within it. And this feels like that novel she's wanted to write where she's kind of got to the point where she's, she's kind of putting the jigsaw pieces together. So it just felt... Yeah, like perfection. I just love her writing. I love the way she builds a novel. But yeah, sometimes when I finish a book, I'm like, oh, I really loved that, but I can't quite put my finger on what's so special about it. So, so when that happens, I go and read reviews, like by professional reviewers in like papers and stuff, right? And I, I read a lot of positive reviews, a couple by authors I really enjoyed. And I could, you know, like one was by Melissa Harrison, who wrote All Among the Barley. And I could understand why she would enjoy Evie Wilde's work. But, but I read a review, which I'll link down below, which tore this book to shreds. And basically said that this book is like a trauma narrative. It's a trauma dump. They said this author's just rehashing all the stuff she's written about trauma before. There's way too much crammed in here. Because of that, it's really kind of melodramatic and overblown and kind of offensive in how ever all the trauma is and they refer to A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara which is a book I hate because of all those things and they said they thought this book kind of sat in that camp. Now I don't agree with that, that isn't what my reading of this book was. I felt like this read, because with A Little Life and this isn't a review of that book but I felt like it didn't I felt like I could really see Hanya Nagahara manipulate us as readers. I did think it was really overall melodramatic and it didn't feel true to me in that. It felt so overblown. This always felt true. This felt like a really honest portrayal of what would happen to a family if, if one person experiences some awful things and are never shown any kind of love or kindness, how they would carry that on to their children and so on and so forth but I do also kind of I read that review and I understood where that person was coming from and so I was left kind of wanting to reread this book in a way to see if I saw it from their perspective but also not wanting to reread it because I don't want to see it from their perspective because I loved it <laughs> so yeah that's what I have to say about this one I had a wonderful experience with it and I really loved it and on that, you know, note, I would recommend it. But also I understand what this review is saying. So I don't know what that really means. But yeah, this book will make it to my favourite books of the year. I thought it was excellent. And again, we'll continue to pre-order what she writes. I'd reread this. And, and I will also say, I do think a large factor in this book being able to kind of hold the amount of trauma that it holds is that it's funny in kind of a very kind of British wry way, which I think really work with all the kind of sadness within it. And also it's very down to earth and kind of amongst the weeds of, like there's just like, there's, there's this ongoing discussion about the fact that leading up to his death, Max was starting to ferment. He was trying to get into fermenting as a kind of household hobby. And there's all these kind of jokes about him burping the cabbages and then after he dies, Hannah doesn't know what to do with all the fermented cabbage and stuff. It feels very... I like books that kind of live in that granular detail of the nitty gritty of being in a relationship or living with somebody. The kind of small things about who's going to empty the bins and oh, who bought that wine and that sort of thing. I think all of that, as well as the humour, really ground this book and mean that the trauma is bearable. So, so yeah, I loved it. Uh, but I would love to hear your thoughts on it, even if they're negative, I would be interested to hear what you ultimately took away from this book. And yeah, that is everything I have to chat about today. It ended up um, being kind of fun to discuss in those last two because they're both books that I can kind of understand people not enjoying them. But yeah, I really did. And yeah, I think that's what, you know, being a reader or being any type of consumer of an art form is, isn't it? We all just have these particular things that will work for us that might not work for others. 
and yeah that's kind of the joy of of reading I guess so yeah those are the books I've read recently are like a really good mixture I think because even the ones I wouldn't necessarily recommend as much I'm still glad I read and I would still keep a lookout for what those authors write in the future but yeah these final three really enjoyed will definitely continue to pre-order all three of these authors books and yeah would love to hear your thoughts on any of these if you've read them thanks for watching and I'll see you later bye